evening, everyone. Welcome back to React Native London. We're glad to have you all joining with us again. This is our second event of the year, uh, and we have some great talks lined up for you. In just some general news about React Native London, uh, we are starting to look at going back to in-person, so for a little bit of history, uh, this event has been going on for several years. Um, and we used to host some really nice in-person events where you had an opportunity to come and listen to some great talks and then afterwards meet and socialize with some fellow developers um, and React Native enthusiasts. Uh, unfortunately, due to COVID, obviously, we've had to switch to a more remote approach, uh, but we are excited to start going back into person very soon. So keep, uh, keep your eyes open for some news about that. Uh, we're very excited uh, as part of the organizer team to, uh, to, to welcome everyone back uh, in person very soon. And on that note, let's get started with tonight's event. So just before that, uh, we are co-organizing this event with Theodo. Um, and that's where the organizers, uh, myself and uh, Callum, Angus, and Ben uh, are currently working at. So uh, at Theodo, we have lean product engineering teams. Uh, we're based in London um, and we work on full stack uh, development, delivering products super quickly. So we work with startup MVPs, scale ups, um, and sometimes more long term uh, big projects. Uh, and as you can see on the right hand side, our tech stack involves a lot of React Native. Uh, along with more, uh, more conventional uh, full stack development tools. So uh, if you're interested in a place where you can feel intellectually challenged um, and solve really fun problems all the time with a group of young enthusiastic uh, cohorts here, Theodo is the place for you. Um, and we are hiring. So we're looking for full stack devs, agile coaches, tech leads and project directors. And if you're interested in any, any of the roles above or if you have any questions um, and want help applying feel free to message myself, uh, Ben, Callum, or Angus. You can find our details on the Meetup uh, page, and we'd be more than happy to help. We're always looking for enthusiastic uh, people to join our team. And without further ado, let's jump into our talks tonight. So we are still going on as part of the Expo series. This is unfortunately the last talk. It's been, some, it's been a great series filled with wonderful topics covered by the Expo core team. Um, we started off with John Sam talking about uh, how you get started and iterate fast with Expo. We touched on CI and CD within Expo, notifications, and so much more. Um, and we have a uh, final uh, talk here tonight um, by our lovely speaker, Quinn. Uh, so Quinn's going to talk to us about how you are able to publish updates with Expo uh, and React Native, uh, and really excited to, to, to learn more about that. Over to you. Hey everyone, my name is Quinn um, and I'll be talking to you today about publish updates with Expo and React Native. So on our roadmap, I'll be going over what exactly an update is, um, how an update works, and the concept of application runtimes. I'll also be going over a feature we're releasing soon called the deployments tool. Um, and I'll be going over the concept of branches and how they relate to updates. And I'll also be talking about things on our roadmap that we're gonna be releasing later this year, such as feature rollouts and updates metering. All right, so let's get started. I want you to first imagine that you're this guy. 
I know that it looks like a stock photo of your everyday average software guy, but really this person is Josh Wardle, the creator of Wordle. And for those of you who don't know, Wordle is a game that went viral recently. And for users, you have to figure out a five letter word in six tries. It's currently hosted at a website called powerlanguage.co.uk. And now that you're Josh Wordle, a really meaningful evolution to Wordle would be to make a mobile app for it. So let's take a look at making a React Native version of Wordle. So it's Friday night and you wanna take a first stab at Wordle. So you put something together and it looks great. And as everybody alludes to on the internet, you really have to look at your app size. So you make an internal distribution on your phone and you see that the Wordle app takes up 16.5 megabytes on your phone, which is pretty reasonable for a first pass. Everything looks good, so you decide to put it up to the app stores and the play stores. So everything's going swimmingly so far, but you notice that reviews start coming in and they honestly don't look so great. You've got Alice complaining that if anybody has actually sanity checked the app, Bob saying that the puzzle is completely ruined and concerned Wordler saying that they solved it in one go. This is honestly really, really confusing as Wordle worked fine when you shipped it. So you download it from the store to see what's going on. And unfortunately, it turns out that you've left in a debug alert giving the entire puzzle away. That's quite unfortunate. And it's no wonder that concerned Wordler solved it in one go. So let's take a look at how to fix this really fast. And let's take a look at the root cause. So the culprit is this one liner here where we're putting up an alert and giving away the answer. But fortunately for you, the fix is quite easy too. You add two chars in front of the line and ta-da, you've commented it out. So now we need a way to deliver this to users really fast. And over the years at Expo, we've developed tools to help people do that. Several years ago, we released something called Expo Publish, which allows you to deliver updates to your users really fast. And we got a lot of uh, um, feedback from folks saying what they liked about it and what they didn't like about it. So we decided to take that feedback and build an entirely new thing. The new thing that we have in preview today is called EAS Update. Um, it does very similar things, um, sends updates down to your users. Um, but one of the big pluses about it is that it works with all React Native apps and it's got a better, more ergonomic workflow. So I'll be talking about EAS Update today, mostly in my presentation. And if you recall, we had that nasty bug in your Wordle. So once you've installed EAS updates, you can go ahead and run EAS update and deploy it to the production branch and specify a human readable message. And in this case, it's fix bug. All right, so let's take a look at what's happening behind the scenes when the end user opens up your app. So the end user, when they load the app, they're going to contact our servers um, when they first load it, and they're going to ask for the newest Wordle update. Our servers are going to see if there has been a new update available, and if there is one, we're going to send it down. And it looks like that you've published um, the fix a couple minutes ago, so we're going to send it down to the Wordle user. And here's what the end user is going to see. They're going to download the buggy version from the store, and upon the next reload of their app, they're gonna take in the new update and they're gonna see the fixed version. So let's also go into the internals of an update. What exactly is it? So if we look at an app binary, we're gonna see that it consists of two different layers. The update layer, which consists of your JavaScript and TypeScript code with your app logic and image assets, such as like JPEGs or PNGs that your app depends on. All these things can change at runtime, and these are things that can change with an update. We've also got something at a native layer, which are things that are considered more static. So for example, your application config, which 
is stuff like your Google services JSON or your info plist, um, things like your app icon or your native code. Those are things that are considered static and can't change with an update delivery. Um, these things can only be changed when you rebuild your app. So enough about updates and more about you. So fortunately for you, because Wordle has gone so viral, the New York Times has taken a lot of interest and eventually buys your game. It's great for you because they bought it for an undisclosed seven figure amount, but people are starting to raise a lot of concerns. The Irish Times asks, will Wordle remain free after its buyout by the New York Times? And The Verge says that Wordle has been bought by the New York Times and will initially remain free for everyone to play. And honestly, it seems like people are expecting you to make a lot of money from Wordle really soon. And we all know that the key to success is to underpromise and overdeliver. So let's start to make money from Wordle as soon as possible and see what it'd look like to implement an in-app purchase. So as I said before, in an app binary, we've got an update layer and a native layer. The update layer is all the things that can change at runtime, and the native layer are the more static things. So let's say we pull in an in-app purchase module from NPM. Let's see how our binary would change in the context of this install. So as usual, your update layer contains your TypeScript files or your JavaScript files. And in the native layer, you'll have in-app purchase modules, like you have the Kotlin versions um, for Android and you have the Swift modules for iOS. So in your application code, when you want people to pay for Wordle, you're probably going to have some code that calls into purchase item async from the module. And when that code is run, say if your end user is running on an Android device, it's going to run the, the logic in the Kotlin modules and it'll call into something like Google Pay. And similarly on an iOS machine, when somebody calls purchase item async, it'll call into the Swift modules and call into stuff like Apple Pay. So let's look at the two app binaries side by side. We've got the free Wordle and the paid Wordle. In the free Wordle, we've got the basic game logic. And in the native layer, we've got basic modules like animation packages that um, free Wordle depends on. And in paid Wordle, we've got everything that free Wordle has, but we've got more payments logic in your update layer. And in particular, in the native layer, we've got your native in-app purchase modules. All right. So now that we've got our paid Wordle binary already, it'll allow you to make um, payments so that people can pay you $4.99 per month for the privilege to pay, play Wordle. But that's not good enough for you. You want to go the extra mile and you want to make even more money. So your big brain idea now is to upsell Wordle products to existing customers. And how exactly is that going to work? So you want to detect if somebody has paid for Wordle and given that they've been using Wordle for long enough, you want to prompt them to buy even more things. All right. So in order to detect whether someone has bought Wordle and how long they've bought it for, you want to call into their purchase history probably. And that will involve a call to in-app purchases and to call something called get purchase history async. So because you've already got a compatible app binary, once you've implemented this feature, you can go ahead and publish it. Again, you can run EAS update, deploy it to the production branch, and add a human readable message. In this case, it's add purchase history. All right. So as we've gone over the differences between the two app binaries, let's take a look at what happens under the hood. So imagine someone is running paid Wordle. When they open up the app, they're going to be asking our servers to give them the newest Wordle update. We're going to take a look and see that, hey, you have published the purchase history feature recently, so we're going to send it down to you. When that code is run on the paid Wordle app, it's going to call into the in-app purchase native module. And depending if you're on Android or iOS, 
run their respective Kotlin modules or the Swift modules. Right, so now let's take a look at free Wordle. If somebody running free Wordle asks just for the newest update from our server, we're gonna say, hey, yeah, there is a new update. You've recently published the purchase history feature. Here you are. Now somebody running free Wordle, when they run this code, it's gonna to expect to run some native module um, for in-app purchases or in-app payments. And unfortunately, it just isn't there on the native layer. And this is really sad because you're gonna get the red screen of death. So from this exercise, we can see that when you have this feature that you published out, it's compatible with paid Wordle but it's not compatible with free Wordle. And that's why we introduced the concept of a runtime version. In free Wordle, we had the basic modules, so we'll give it a runtime version of one. In paid Wordle, we changed the native layer. We add an in-app purchase module, so we'll bump up the runtime version to two. And lastly, we've got this update that we published, and we have to specify which runtime versions it's compatible with. And because we're relying on the in-app purchase module, we're gonna give it a runtime version of two. All right, so let's look at what happens to updates in the context of runtime versions. Somebody with paid Wordle is gonna ask our servers to give them the newest update for runtime version two. We're gonna look and see that you have indeed published the purchase history feature. So we're gonna give it to the paid Wordler and everything's going to work out fine. In the case of free Wordlers, they're going to ask the servers for the newest update for runtime version one because they have a different native layer. And we're going to do the correct thing this time. And we're going to say, hey, there aren't any new compatible updates. So what will end up happening is that the free Wordlers will just continue on with the original code they have. And at Expo a couple months ago, um, we put together a UI to help visualize all these deployments. Because as your app gets more mature, you're gonna bump the runtime versions a lot and you're gonna deploy to production and perhaps beta environments. And it's kind of hard to keep track of what updates you're gonna get. So here's a look at what a deployment UI would look like in the context of free Wordle. You've deployed to the production channel. You've got a runtime version of one. And if anybody with free Wordle asks for the newest update, we're gonna give you the fixed alert bug that we published a long time ago. In the context of paid Wordle, we're gonna see that you've deployed it to the production channel. It's got a runtime version of two. And if anybody asks for the newest updates, we're gonna give you the payments history feature. And this deployment's UI is on track to be released in the next cycle, so it'll be out really soon. All right, so you've got the paid Wordle out in the wild for a while, and you're dying to see what people are saying about your app because it's quite a big change. So Alice is starting to complain that payments is definitely not in the spirit of Wordle. Bob is saying that Wordle is extremely overpriced, and the concerned Wordler is just concerned about paying money altogether. So you sit down and you have another big brain idea. You ask yourself, what if we showed ads to people who don't want to pay? You have the best of both worlds because people who don't want to pay will see the freemium app and people who, don't, who do want to pay will have a better in-app experience. All right, so let's quickly take a look at what the app binary would look like for a paid Wordle with ads. You're gonna have your initial logic for your app, the game logic, the payments logic, and you're gonna have additional ads logic. And in the native layer, we have the basic modules um, and the in-app purchase module. And if you're using something like Google AdMob, you're gonna have to update your Google services JSON or your info plist. And these are all things that are static and can only change when they're rebuilt. And because they're a change in the native layer, we wanna bump the runtime version from two to three. 
And let's also take a look at your development flow. You're most likely going to be committing to your main Git branch, and you're going to be adding really nicely formatted commits, like add in app purchases, add payments history, and the works. But unfortunately for you, you honestly don't have time to implement the ads feature, so you're going to delegate it to your intern. Your intern is going to be working from the ads beta Git branch and is going to be making a lot of sketchy commits. So fortunately for you, you have time to diligently go over all the PRs that your intern has. But the problem is that ads beta diverges a lot from the main Git branch. So it's just easier to deploy the intern's branch. So when we look at the deployment for paid Wordle with ads, we'll see that it's been deployed to production. It's got a runtime version of three. But instead of deploying the main branch, you're going to be deploying the intern's ads beta branch. And the newest update that is going to be delivered is the blah update, whatever that means. So now that you've got paid ads out in the wild, it looks good initially. You've done the QA and people see ads, and they also see a prompt to pay you if they don't like ads. But there's a lot of edge cases in apps. And as people will see, the entrance branch is really unstable. There's a lot of edge cases that lead to a lot of fatal errors. And that's really unacceptable. You can't have this out in production any longer. So let's take a look at how we can fix this. All right, if we go back to the deployments UI for paid Wordle with ads, you'll see that we've got this edit button in the corner. And if you click on it, you'll see that you can edit the deployment. So currently the deployment is mapped to the intern's ads beta branch, but it'll give you the option to swap it back to your more stable main branch. It'll give you a preview of changes. So if anybody is asking for the newest update, we'll give you the payments history feature. If you go ahead and deploy it, we'll give you a confirmation um, as well as all the changes that have been made. So what the end user will see is that they'll download it, they'll download the paid with ads version from the store. And upon the next reload, they'll see the paid only version of Wordle. So unfortunately for you, the damage has been done and Wordle with ads has been out with the unstable branch for a while. So let's see what people are saying. Alice is once again complaining that she absolutely hates the ads. Bob says that Wordle has way too many ads and concerned Wordler is concerned about the ads. So you sit down and think to yourself, and say that, hey, ads could really be successful, but also they could be a complete disaster. But honestly, there's no way to really know unless if you deploy it to people in the wild. But let's look at your user base. It really, it really sucks that you have to deploy ads to your entire user base to find out that everybody's pissed off about it. And there might be a better way to go about this. So let's take a look at your users. You've got Alice, Bob and the concerned Wordler. Instead of deploying it to everybody all at once, it'd be really nice to say if you could roll it out to a third of your users instead. So in this example, it would be really nice if you gave ads to Alice, whereas Bob and the concerned Wordler would have the original version still. If Alice says that she absolutely hates the ads, you can roll it back and give her the original version, and Bob and Concerned Wordler would be none the wiser. But in the case where Alice says that she loves ads, you can continue rolling it out to Bob and eventually Concerned Wordler incrementally. So this feature is called Feature Rollouts. It's on a roadmap and is on track to be released later this year. Another thing that you might think is really useful is to figure out who actually received your fixes. So if we can recall from the beginning, people were downloading your buggy Wordle and you right away deployed a fix um, to make things right. And in reality, 
The sad truth is not everybody is going to get your fix. Not everybody is going to open up the Wordle app to get the update, or people may be in an area where there's no reception or really bad internet, and they're not going to be able to download your update. It'd be really nice to know how many people downloaded your original app. So for example, you can see that like 3,000 users have received your update. And it'd be really nice to know how many people actually downloaded your fix. And these metrics are important for making um, decisions regarding your app going forward. And this feature is on a roadmap also and is on track to be released later this year. So that's all I have for today, um, the end of my presentation, and thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for that, Quinn. And I, I thought it was really interesting. And I learned a lot out of it, uh, especially the, the roadmap stuff that you've got looks really exciting. The incremental rollouts, uh, I'll, be, I'll be super excited to use that when that comes out. So uh, we have a few questions uh, and we'll jump into them. So uh, Nicola sent a message saying that he really enjoyed your talk. So he's a great talk. Uh, and he was wondering if you could specify how often update deliveries are happening. Does the user have to close and reopen the app? What's the, what's the exact way that the updates get delivered? Yeah, so um, there's a couple policies that you can provide um, to determine how often this happens. But the default is that we'll be getting, like upon, like when the person starts up the app, it'll run what's originally on your app binary, but in the background, it will be fetching the update from our servers. And the next time somebody opens the app, um, it will show the new version. Um, but you can also change that policy. So people who don't want to download any updates can disable it. And I think we have a couple other policies. I, I'm not really sure off the top of my head, but that to my knowledge is a default policy. Sure, uh, thanks for that. Uh, the another question that we've had is where will the deployment UI sit? So I think you showed the like the little deployment UI that showed you know what the process was for each of the runtime versions. Uh, is that integrated as part of like a CD pipeline? So maybe you can see it on GitHub, or will it be on a, a part of the Expo website? Yeah. So when I was making it a couple months ago, I put it into the Expo website. So like when you go into your project from the website, like in the corner on the toolbar, you'll be able to see there's like a place for the deployment um, UI. Um, and it'll be really clear, but because everything is in preview and we developed it like so recently, it could change um, based on what people are telling us. If they don't like it there, um, yeah, we can change it. But for now, it's going to be in the project view um, on the toolbar to the side. Cool. Uh, another one that we were having was how much will uh, using EAS uh, increase the app size? Uh, so if presumably EAS binaries are getting included into the package that's being sent out to, to the App Store or the Play Store, does that have a noticeable size increase to the packages that your users are going to get? Or is it kind of minimal? Yeah, so to my knowledge, it's kind of minimal. So when I made the, or when we made the Expo Wordle, um, I actually did put it on my phone and the size of Wordle was 16.5 megabytes with updates installed. Um, I don't, I, I didn't really check what it would have been without updates, but it's not a huge package. So I don't imagine it to be quite sizable. Sure, that's great. 
Um, and then I think we have one final one. Uh, so Barbora has uh, said that this isn't necessarily completely on topic, but she really liked your presentation skills and said that they're amazing. So she was wondering if you have any tips for preparing and for running technical talks. It's a bit of a, uh, it's a bit of an unconventional one. Yeah. So I'd say there's the conventional wisdom of preparing your talk ahead of time. And a lot of times when I go to the conference, everybody on the airplane is just writing their talk on the airplane. Um, but I'd say that the best way to do it is just to tell people that you're gonna have a dry run a couple of days before. So it forces you to make everything before and to run everything through before so you can catch all the bugs before going into the actual presentation. There you go, dry running is the secret. Awesome. Well, that was really informative. I feel like I learned a lot and I'm sure everybody else did. So thank you so much, Quinn. And it was really engaging. Like the story with Wordle was really quite interesting to listen through and go through. So thank you so much for the talk. Um, and it was, it was really insightful. It's a pleasure. Awesome. And without further ado, let's jump into our second speaker of the night. So next up, we have Callum Hemsley. He is one of uh, my good friends here at Theodore UK. We, uh, we, he is going to be looking at monorepos uh, in React Native uh, and going to be talking some of the, about some of the experiences that he's had working on a project with a React Native monorepo, um, as well as some of the tooling that's helped him uh, ease the process a little bit. So over to you, Callum. Thank you, Quinn. That was an amazing presentation. I really learned a lot about Expo and the new features coming. I, th I thought it was really interesting. Um, thank you, everyone else as well, for taking the time to come and to see React Native London Meetup. Um, I'm Callum. I'm a de developer at Fiodo, and I'm going to do a talk on monorepos with React Native. So let's look at what we'll cover. Um, the four main things we're going to cover are the sort of use case for monorepos in React Native, why we've chosen to do them in the project I'm on, issues we've had setting that up, uh, tools that made that easier, and then reviewing, was it really worth it? So before we get started on that, I think it's worth just asking the question, what is a monorepo? So I had a sort of misconception with monorepos and I thought it would a monorepo is simply a backend, a front end, and maybe a database in separate folders just within one repository. And that's that's all a monorepo could be. But that is sort of a subset of monorepos and not the entire story. So the sort of definition of a monorepo could be a single repository that stores all of your code and assets for many projects. So that's slightly different from what I just said because each of these projects could be completely individualistic. For example, Google basically has all of its projects in one repository and that is considered a monorepo as well. Now, what I'm going to be talking about today is what is more of a traditional monorepo to me, which is multiple apps in one repository, but it's, it's worth mentioning that it could be different. So a good um, tool and, and sort of website to discover about monorepos 
is monorepo.tools. I think this is a really new website. It's got amazing visualizations, um, explanations as well of, of what monorepos are. And one of its best features, it's got like these really cool comparisons between different monorepo tools. So definitely check it out. That's monorepo.tools. Cool. Um, another thing I'd, I'd like to just clarify is that like monorepos aren't the same as a monolith. So monoliths, when we talk about monoliths, we're talking about tightly coupled code. Um, whereas a monorepo, these projects often can be used individually and they're logically independent. So a sort of example of a monolith might be a Ruby on Rails project where it handles the website, the API endpoints and the background jobs all together. Um, so yeah, now that we have like an understanding of monorepos, let's get some project context before seeing how we can build a monorepo architecture with React Native. So um, the, the client I'm working for currently was originally a magazine publisher. So back in the day, they had sports magazines, gardening magazines, foot, football magazines, all of it. Um, so yeah, they've, they've got all of these types of brands and now the digital revolution has obviously happened. So they started creating websites for each of their brands. Now, a really interesting thing here is that when they did this, uh, they used shared APIs. So each of the websites uses the same API to fetch the content, the same API to log in, and the same API to save collections, for example. And now we're on to the next phase, which is our task, which is to build some apps. So we're, we're basically tasks, tasked with building multiple apps for each brand. So to recap, we've got a load of different brands and different apps and lots of shared functionality between these apps. So we thought, you know, a monorepo really would fit this use case. Um, if we create a monorepo, we can have like a, a common shared folder of code that all of these apps can reuse code from, no copy paste and no redundant code. Um, as well as we could have like a sort of config driven app system. And, and what I mean by that is that each app will have a, a config where you can change things as color systems, uh, what, what different buttons say, but all apps sort of have a similar um, code base, which is really cool. And it allows us to spin up new apps, new magazines really, really fast. So let's talk a bit about how could we make a monorepo in React Native. So the first place we looked, because we, did, we weren't sure when we started this project, was the React Native docs. However, the React Native docs didn't really have too much documentation for monorepos. They did suggest in the Mac OS plus Windows OS documentation, this kind of um, architecture where we have you know, a shared Android, iOS, Mac OS, Windows folders for the, for the native code, and then a single source. Um, and this, this is okay. And I think it works in a lot of, lot, lot of use cases, but ultimately this is a single app that runs on different platforms, which isn't really what we want. We want multiple apps. So, you know, the fact that there's just a single package that JSON means all of these apps would have to use the same dependency versions. It's just not ideal. So we had a, a bit of a shop around and we came across Yarn Workspaces. Now, Yarn Workspaces is nothing new. Babel has been using this for ages for all of their packages. Um, one of the basic ideas of Yarn, Yarn Workspaces is that you set up multiple packages in one repo. In our use case, each package would basically be an app. Um, so we're gonna have like a test app one here, a test app two, and then we're also gonna have a shared common folder for all of the shared uh, code and that in itself is also a package um, so one thing that's worth pointing out really about this is that each app will have its own package json so that means different dependencies for each package which is really awesome but um, it's also worth mentioning that once we run yarn install we'll get um, a node modules folder at the root level of the of the yarn workspace um, and that basically means we can run yarn install once and for every app, uh, dependencies will be installed and all stored at the root level in the node modules. Um, and that also has its own package to JSON for configuring yarn workspaces. Cool. So why, why do this? A um, couple of reasons. Um, firstly, having node modules at root level rather than in each separate 
uh, app means that we have a single lock file, so less conflicts for version management. And it also means less duplicate dependencies because all shared uh, dependencies between each app stay at the root level in the node module folder. So what has this really become? This is from what we were before, which is a single app that runs on different platforms. We are now, in we have multiple apps that share common JavaScript code. And that's a really important thing that we needed for our use case. Cool, so how do we go about implementing a Yarn workspace? So it's actually quite basic. Um, in the root directory package JSON, we just need to define our Yarn workspaces like so. There we go just like this. So we have a common, a test app one, and a test app two. So test app one, test app two, again, are our different magazines. And then common is where the sh shared code will be. So this is really useful. Um, in, each, in each app, we'd need to add um, basically also common as a dependency. So because common is sort of like an NPM package, we need to add it as a dependency for the shared code. And we just need to add that to each package JSON for each app. Cool. So once we start uh, doing our build, we're going to run into issues. Uh, for example, there we go. So for example, we're going to run into this kind of issue when we do pod install. Um, it's pretty cryptic. I wouldn't read it if I were you. There's no point. <laughs> Put it that way. It's it's it won't it won't get you anywhere. Um, Unfortunately, we're going to have this like sad cat and you're just going to be left confused like I am. Um, so the hint I will give about this is it's a hoisting issue. So I'm going to do my best to explain hoisting and why, why this is an issue, but it's a pretty lengthy discussion. We'll give it a go. So um, before we sort of discussed how node modules would be at the root folder of the directory, right? And this is a result of hoisting. So what is hoisting? Uh, well, in monorepos, we have multiple packages. Here, package one, package two would be test app one, test app two. And then we're going to have multiple um, different dependencies scattered across these packages, right? So the idea of hoisting is to flatten these dependencies and hoist them up to the root node modules folder. And this looks like this. Cool. So why would we do hoisting here? Um, sort of basic explanation is that um, if we have multiple apps, then really dependency trees can get very complex. In this diagram, we've got a simple dependency tree. We've got a couple of packages. You've got A, 1.0, etc. These are all dependencies. There's only a couple, but we all know that in real apps, there's thousands of npm packages everywhere so it can get really complex so hoisting um allows like this to be simplified and then the other main benefit is that um it reduces the amount of copies of modules so brief example here we've got package b 1.0 it's used both by package one and package two um, once that's hoisted on the right, you see that it just goes to the root node modules and it's deduplicated. It's only there once. So we're reducing redundancy, which is really cool. Um, so we're keeping the tree nice and flat and nice and simple. Now, not all modules go in the root node modules. You might have noticed B2.0 doesn't get hoisted in, in, in a traditional sense, right? It's, it's staying in package one. Now, why is that? So there's a couple of reasons this could be, but the main reason is that uh, any dependencies that already exist in node modules, for example, B1.0, but have a different version. Here we have B2.0, so it's just a different version of the same dependency. They shouldn't be hoisted to the uh, root node modules. It, it's going to get confusing, right? Because you're going to have different versions in the same node modules. It's kind of confusing. So it will stay in the package where it is, and then we can access that um, basically when we do a pod install or anything like that, we access from the root node modules. And then we do this really cool thing called sim linking to get to that B 2.0 package. Now, what is sim linking? It, I never knew what this is until I started this project. It, it sounds really complicated. It's basically like a Windows shortcut. Um, my friend 
gave this analogy yesterday and I thought it was brilliant. You, it's basically just a pointer. It, it points to, um, for example, in, in this one, it just points to package one um, from the root node modules. That's all it does. So we can access it through the symlink. Cool. So now we understand a little bit about what hoisting is and what symlinking is. Why, why was this happening? Well, to recap, as a result of hoisting, dependencies are fetched from the root node modules folder. And any modules that aren't in the root node modules folder are fetched via symlinking. Now, why is this an issue? Well, native code, unfortunately, can't follow symlinks. So sometimes native code in iOS or Android maybe needs to reference something in test app one or test app two, um, but it's trying to do that through the root node modules. And that's just not possible. Native code can't follow symlinks. So what can we do about that? Well, there's this really nifty thing called no hoist. Um, basically, it's a setting that disables the selected modules from being hoisted to the project root. Now, this allows us to access modules we can't access from the root node modules. It cuts out the symlinking. Uh, because they aren't hoisted, it means we gain back some duplication, however. So we sort of need to be careful and manage this. The aim, ideally, is to keep this no hoist list as small as possible. Now, you might have noticed that React Native uh, is appearing twice in a no hoist list. So the first instance uh, basically tells Yarn that re the React Native library should not be hoisted. And the second instance with the additional star star afterwards tells Yarn that all of that React Native's dependencies, for example, Metro, React Native CLI should also not be hoisted. Uh, sometimes it's just easier to not hoist like this. So it's, it's a useful thing to know. So we've done this, we've got the no hoist list. We're ready to build. We can, we can do our pod install finally with, with no errors. We're ready to start developing. Um, the sun is shining. It's time to spin up the simulator and get developing. Except <laughs> we're going to get into bundle errors next. So unfortunately, <laughs> we thought we were done um, with any issues, but unfortunately, hoisting issues are going to crop up again. Now, this time, I just want to just show you this, this no, not again meme. <laughs> so this time, it's not native code um causing issues this time it's metro so the metro bundler uh comes with react native and bundles the code for us when we when we want to run in the simulator or you know do stuff now this is metro's most famous limitation and it's that metro cannot follow symlinks it's actually the the first ever issue metro had um, it's still open and they have no plan to fix it um, so <laughs> we can't really rely on Metro to follow symlinks here. It's just not possible. So what's going to happen this, what's, what's happened this time? Um, it's actually interesting that it's the opposite of what was happening before with the pod install issue. So when we were doing the pod install issue, we were trying to access, for example, test app one modules from the root node modules. Now this time it's the complete opposite. We can't access the hoisted root node modules from test app one. Metro can't see outside of its own package, basically. It doesn't know how to get outside. How can we fix this? Well, this brilliant guy, Mateo, has developed a really, really useful uh, library, React Native Monorepo tools. So what this does basically is makes Metro aware of the node module directory outside of test app one. So not only does that allow us to see the root uh, node modules, but it also allows us to see our shared common package that we're going to be using a lot. So um, all that's really needed to do that is we need to update, update our Metro config file like so, and just add like, for watch folders, monorepo Metro tools, the watch folders, and let the let the library do the rest really so we finally did it guys we've we're ready to develop the sun is actually shining we made it that's the main issues that we really had um with monorepos and setting them up so i thought it's worth talking and discussing a couple of other features that will help improve the dev experience. So these aren't things that fixed issues exactly, but they help the dev experience. So one thing we're using 
is Bob Build. Now, Bob Build is an interesting one. We're using this in the common shared folder. And usually in React Native, we just compile code at build time with Metro when running the app. Now, what Bob Build lets us do for our common shared fo folder is um, build and transpile our code to CommonJS and also generate type definitions for our common shared folder. That means we can use the types and stuff outside of the common and use it like, like an NPM package, basically, because that's, that's, that's essentially what the common shared folder is acting as. Now, this, this really helps us because it keeps our options open in the future. Say we wanted to ship this as in a private NPM package. We've already got this Bob Builder set up. Um, happy days, really. So how do we use it? Basically, just inside the common package folder, we need to add this to our uh, package JSON again. So all this is saying really is in the source. Um, so that's where we want to um, transpile from. And then our output is, is the sort of the end folder where the, the build will go. And then the targets is just saying things that we want. So for example, we want to transpile to common JS and we want to have type. Now, that's a really cool feature. And then another thing that we use, interestingly enough, is Learner. Now, Learner itself is actually a tool for managing multi-package repositories with Git and NPM. So it's a monorepo tool itself, but we don't really use it as such. The only feature we use of Learner is to run things in parallel. Um, so that's testing, type checking, and linting. Why do it one by one when we could do it in parallel, speed up that that build, build times, that CI CD, you know, improve the dev experience. Um, now, this is basically all we use Learner for. And it's um, it's quite interesting, really, that it works very well with Yarn workspaces. One might think that um, they would be incompatible. However, that's not true. They work really well. Good to know. So apart from these handy tools, I think it's worth discussing in reflection so far in the project, uh, the positives and the negatives. So what re really went well with the monorepo approach is that for our use case where we're sharing tons of code for different magazines and you know they're really using the same thing and, and it's just a customizable config driven uh, app, um, it, it means that we can edit that common shared folder in the same repository. We get easily easy visibility of the code. It's all in the same place. Um, and we don't need to play around with private NPM packages as I'll get onto in a minute. Now, it also means we can bootstrap new magazine apps really fast. Say they buy a new magazine and they want to sh start shipping something straight away. We, all we really need to do is provide it a config and a couple of routing things, and then they're ready to ship. So it's super fast dev experience. Now, there is, of course, some negatives. Um, I'm sure I made it clear that these errors that we're getting are really cryptic. Sometimes it doesn't really feel like they have anything to do with the error. Um, and like I had to spend, and, and my team had to spend a lot of time sort of configuring and deb debugging the build process to get it right. So it's a lot of upfront cost in terms of time and uh, resources. Another sort of issue we've been experiencing recently is our CI CD. So we're using Bitrise. Uh, doesn't really seem to support monorepos in the way we want. We'd ideally want just one Bitrise and have multiple sort of deployments coming out of that. We're probably going to end up with uh, doing multiple bit rises within just one repository, but it's not ideal. We wanted it to be uh, one shared place so we could manage it all in one rather than having a nice uh, split up. So that's unfortunate. Now, you might have already asked, like, why not the privately shared NPM package? What's wrong with a private shared NPM package here? Well, um, so it's it's quite interesting. We've we've had teams at Fiodo do it before. And it ended up being pretty cumbersome. Um, for example, say you wanted to make a change in the shared common folder. Now, that's going to be wired up as a private NPM package uh, for publishing to start with. But you're then going to, every time you want to change or test it locally, you're going to have to rewire it for, lo for local testing and then rewire it back to publish. So it just adds a lot of time. And um, I feel like the dev experience isn't great for that. 
So for, for us, we felt like whilst we're making constant changes at the start of the project, it makes sense to just have it within the monorepo for easy and fast changes and instant responses. Now, this does have some advantages though. So it's not like we've completely dismissed it. We feel like it may be a good idea once we have a solid foundation for the apps and that it's more of a maintenance mode. So uh, a big advantage of having like these privately shared NPM packages is the good version management. We could, if we wanted to, have certain uh, magazine apps uh, be a different sort of version for the common shared code to other apps. You could have like 1.0 for uh, your sports mag and then 2.0 for your gardening mag um, and easy, easy to roll back as well. So in terms of version management, it, it would be useful to have. And it's something we're, we're definitely looking at doing in the future. So um, key free, free key takeaways for this talk is that monorepos in React Native work well with lots of shared code between apps. So we've really experienced like fast developer speed and easy visibility. Um, I, I really feel like it's been a pretty good success in terms of that. Um, however, I would say if you had two entirely separate apps uh, within a monorepo, is it really worth it? If they only had like a, a bit of shared functionality, for example, they might have like spaces or something, is it really worth that upfront cost of configuring the build to have it in a monorepo? Perhaps not. I think in our case where we've got lots of shared code, it's really worth it. Um, that's definitely something you'll have to consider going forward. Now, again, second bullet point, React Native really struggles with symlinking. Whether that's native code or Metro, symlinking doesn't want to work and it's going to cause a load of issues to do with hoisting. But hoisting is really awesome. Like it, it reduces complexity and reduces redundancy. So we really want to keep that no hoist list as small as possible. And then finally, tools do make things easier. You know, Yarn workspaces, no hoisting, React Native Monorepo tools, just to name a few, have really helped. And I'm sure there's other tools that we haven't even yet found that are just going to help just as much. So I, I do think like Monorepos have a really good future within the React Native ecosystem. And I'm really excited to see what comes out next. Cool. Thank you for the talk. Brilliant. <laughs>
I know this is maybe perhaps not the most satisfactory answer, um, but it really just depends on what you have on the config um, and not really um, what is in the mono repo at large. Cool. Thanks for that. So let's jump into some of the questions that we've got from the audience. Uh, so Nicola's uh, come in again and asked, um, Callum, if you've looked into any other monorepo specific build tools such as uh, Bazel or others on your project? Yeah, no, it's it's a good question. Um, personally, I haven't. Um, again, like that monorepo.tools has some really good comparisons for different uh, monorepo uh, things. I, I saw on there like NX especially was like tick for every single comparison. So I definitely check that out, um, but it's something we really want to do. And I, I think it's really interesting that we haven't done that yet. Cool. Uh, another question that we've gotten from the chat from Karina is uh, they were wondering what other alternative tools there are to Yarn workspaces. So I think you mentioned uh, Lerna. Is there anything else that you're aware of to kind of manage mono repos? I think you briefly touched on it in the previous question as well. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think the main ones, um, that work uh, with React Native, I know, like the, the main two are Learner and Yarn Workspaces because they're quite unopinionated mm -hmm. and don't require too much like setup. Um, I'd be really interested to see like if NX or any of the other ones on monorepo.tools work, um, but I haven't tried them mm -hmm. personally. Awesome. We've got a wiser every day saying that you should definitely write a Medium article or tutorial for monorepos in RN. So you've got all of the encouragement there. Um, <laughs> so we've got another question uh, saying, uh, and I think you briefly touched on this, but maybe just 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 to remind the audience, um, what exactly symlinking is. Sure. So yeah, symlinking symlinking sounds really really complicated. It's it's actually not. It's like it's when you want to go from one file or folder to another. It's almost the same as a Windows shortcut link that you that you can create. It's like a little pointer. So when we use it in hoisting. We're going from, for example, the root node modules. We might want to go into test app one's node modules to go get a module that, that isn't in the root node modules, right? Now, the only way to do that is through symlinking. So what you do is you put a symlink from, basically within the root, root node modules, you'll have like symlinks for uh, each of your different packages. So you're going to have a symlink for test app one, test app two, et cetera. Now, what basically just happens is when you need the package, it like tries to find it in the root node modules. It realizes it's not there, and then it will go into that specific package and get the get the module that's needed. Um, and then uh, I think the final question that I can see from the audience uh, is from Barbora. Uh, she was wondering if you were to go back in time and set up a mono repo for a React Native native project from scratch again, what would you do differently? I think the biggest, the biggest thing I would have done differently is explored other options. Um, I know we briefly touched on this before, Mo, like um, before before this talk, we we were sort of discussing money repos um, and the fact that possibly Metro Bundler could be switched out for something like Webpack. Um, maybe maybe that would, if if that is indeed possible, that would you know save a lot of these no hoisting issues. Um, so I think maybe it's just a bit more of like an experiment of a little bit of like spikes, I guess, a little bit of prototypes and, and see what's what's out there a bit more rather than just sticking with Yarn workspaces. Sure. And I think that's an interesting question, I guess, um, because I know that I've seen that you can select Webpack uh, as part of your Expo configuration. And maybe Quinn, you might know a little bit more about this. Is that Webpack uh, selection uh, within uh, within your Expo setup for, for your React Native project just uh, exclusively used for, for compiling the web version of your of your app when you have a React Native app, or is it also used for, for, for like actually transpiling and compiling um, uh, the mobile versions as well? So from when I last looked, we do use Webpack for the web, but we mm -hmm. use the Metro Bundler for um, the iOS and Android versions of the bundle. Mm. But that might have changed recently. I do remember my coworker Evan saying that he did swap it out recently. So, very um, cool. Yeah, I can look into that. I'll I'll definitely be uh, tweeting out to you and hopefully getting in touch because that'll be really cool. All right, 
Awesome. So I think we're getting some uh, people in the audience saying that they really enjoyed both of the talks. Um, I don't see any more questions. So I think we can start wrapping up. Uh, it was wonderful to, to listen to both of your talks, Quinn and Callum. Uh, I personally really enjoyed it and I'm sure everyone in the audience did. Uh, and it was a pleasure hosting this month's React Native London. And we hope to see everyone soon, hopefully in person uh, in March. So see you guys all very soon. Ciao. Absolutely. See you guys. <laughs>